<laughs> all right. I don't want that laugh to be too intense uh, because it's only the second round. and We all still have more work to do. But Chris Paul, Mr. Fourth Quarter, does it again. Phoenix up 2-0 on Dallas. So let's run through some of the important stuff. Luca took a little time. 9-0 start there for Phoenix. A couple minutes in, then it's like, all right, I'm going to take over 10 straight points. He was absurd in the first half. Um, slight little storyline to pay attention to because Luca runs hot. We know that. And I guess guys were giving it to him and he started talking to people. And then we saw that thing where he's going to the tunnel. He didn't have a very good third quarter. There was theories that that had something to do with it, um, that maybe he was tired. I think as soon as Reggie Miller said, maybe he's tired, he's doing too much. I mean, he does carry this offense. Reggie Bullock had some moments as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, Dallas is just going to hit threes, but it wasn't the case because Luca just constantly, I, I don't know what to do with him. I don't know what to do with him if you're another team. Um, it's absurd what he is offensively. So there you go. 30 fouls called in the first half. Uh, there was a man named Dick Harder who was an assistant coach in the NBA, a lifer in basketball. Um, he was kind of like the original defensive coordinator. Maybe there was somebody before him. Dick Harder was uh, was around a long time. And he used to have this line about fouling and physical defense. He says they can't call everything. That was his theory. Hack the shit out of people because they can't call everything. It's still a product for entertainment. They can't call fouls every single possession. If they do that, it's not a great game to watch. The refs last night did not get that memo because they called everything. There were seven offensive fouls in one stretch in Phoenix. And I'm telling you, like every single possession down, there was a really bad stretch there in the third quarter. This is ridiculous. Aiton picks up his fifth foul, nine plus minutes to go in the third quarter. He didn't come again until uh, come back until 545. So we've got Luka going off in the first half. We've got another game where I'll admit every time I watch the two teams play, I just go Phoenix has more options. And those options, there could be a night where it doesn't happen. But for... Too many games in this series, Phoenix will, they will show you all the options and the things that they can go to. So we go to the fourth quarter. Chris Paul goes for 14 points on six of seven shooting with a couple of assists. Let's run through it. Paul makes a three. He's got a layup, a pull up, a floater, a pull up, and the end one where he started talking shit to the Dallas bench on this one. Uh, sprinkled in there, he had an assist or a cam three, the bridges lob on the fast break. Um, but there was something I thought that was very telling and very Chris Paul. Uh, it wasn't all Luca hunting, although it felt that way at times, because Biombo ended up having to play some of the center minutes, and it's just classic Phoenix with this system that Biombo actually looks serviceable um, because you have somebody like Chris Paul, and Biombo's at least going to give you effort. Um, and JaVale's been terrific in this backup role, but then he had foul trouble too. So Biombo's carrying them for some of these minutes, not carrying them, but you understand the point. And so if Luca were on Biombo because they're trying to save Luca and they don't want to have Luca out on the perimeter defensively, Biombo would set the screen. So then Dallas was like, all right, well, let's have Luca on Shamit. And then Shamit starts to set the screen. And then they actually went back to putting Luca on Biombo. So it wasn't always Biombo or Shamit, Luca's man, setting the screen for Chris Paul because there were other times where Paul got Kleber. Um, there was a couple moments there with Bullock. The up fake that he had was on Reggie Bullock who, again, changed the pronunciation of his name, which caught me off guard when I started hearing people say Bullock, like some Bond villain. But here we are. Um, congratulations. But then there was a play where I think almost every other guy in the NBA, going the way Paul was in this fourth quarter, would have given you that absurd step-back heat check three. And Paul knew, okay, they're bringing the pressure way out. They're, they're going out of their way now. The game is probably over here, but they're going out of their way to stop me and keep two with me. And he knew what they were doing. So he went away from everybody else and immediately got it to Shamit, who got it to Bridges. And I think Biombo got the layup there. And it was like the perfect Chris Paul heat check where it's like, yeah, I know what you think I might do. And now you're going to freak because I've torched you here for six minutes. I'm actually going to pretend I'm going to put myself in a bad situation in the half court set. And I know exactly what you're doing and I'm already planning on what I'm doing. So I'm going to take you a little bit further away from everything that's happening. Um, and there you go. Aiton played 18 minutes, and this is what happened. Booker actually, I'm not going to call it a, a quiet 30, po uh, 30 points for Booker because that's not fair. Booker had nine at the half. As soon as the second half started, Booker's like, all right, enough of this shit. He takes over, and then after Paul went out, Booker came in and stuck two threes, and they actually, I think he got Luca on, on one of the two. So this one was over. Um, I don't, I don't think it's fair yet, but I'm just telling everybody it's going to happen. Uh, 
if Dallas gets, you know, the sweep always sounds worse than than losing in seven. But I just don't think the two teams are close. I know that after the trade deadline, it is crazy, and the broadcast reminded all of us of this, that Dallas had the second best record behind Boston in the NBA since the trade deadline. But as I pointed out, as their record held up really well, their overall numbers and a lot of stuff didn't match the win-loss. Uh, and, and that was winning a lot of close games. They turned around their clutch performance where they were disasters. And they know they're a better defensive team, but they were ninth and 14th in offensive and defensive rating after the trade deadline, despite having the second best record. So those things didn't really add up. But there will be, if this is a disappointing finish, Luca will start to enter that territory after winning a round where you go, hey, wait a minute. How come we complain about Trey Young, but we don't do the same with Luca? How come we do this, but we're not doing it with Luca? It's just the rules, man. I say it all the time. These are the rules, and this is what will happen. The hardened comps, who I do think the playing style, the heliocentric part of it, the drives, the amazing passing, the ability to shoot. Uh, I thought Luca looked a lot like Harden before the draft because of his angles and his driving and going slower, and it didn't matter, and just riding you and putting his hip on you, and there's just you're helpless against it. But it's going to happen. I don't think it's fair right now, but I'm just telling you. There you go. Let's hit three other series because that's all we have real quick. Uh, Boston and Milwaukee even. Jalen's the key for the Celtics. I felt that way before the series, and I feel even stronger about it after game one and game two. One of the worst games I've ever seen from him and one of the best games I've ever seen from him back-to-back days. Uh, Without Middleton, I really think the Celtics should win this series. They're as good as you started to believe they could be, but you're always worried about Giannis. But the Celtics have done a really good job defending Giannis. He's 20 of 52 overall in the two games. He's not hitting threes, which we wouldn't expect, but he's missing his free throws again. He's at 55%. Giannis is going to get his 30 and 12. It's how many assists does he get? How efficient is it? And how's the rest of the team going to shoot around him? Um, Because Milwaukee was terrible from three. They were 318 in game two. Boston made 23, so plus 17 and threes in game two. You wouldn't expect that to be the trend where one team has a 17 made three advantage game to game, but stuff happens. And we'll get to that in the summary of all of this. But A lot of it is being shot ready where I felt like Boston, you know the scattering report, you're going to have a bunch of threes, they're going to be there for you, just be a little bit more ready. And Jalen going off, obviously. I think the Boston defense is still there. I know Milwaukee's defensive rating is really high, but I felt like going up against Chicago, it's almost like it's not even fair to to bake that into the rating there. So uh, we head to game three. Philadelphia and the Heat. Heat up 2-0. No no Lowry and it isn't close. Obviously, Embiid not being there completely changes who Philadelphia is. Uh, Philly in game one was 6 of 34 from three. You're like, hey, 18%. That's not going to happen again. They only shot at 8 of 30% in game two. There's, they're just slow. They're really slow. There's all these possessions where I'll watch and go, I know you don't have a chance, and I know you're trying to figure this whole thing out. And by the way, the DeAndre Jordan stubbornness, he barely played in game two. So it was almost like, hey, he's going to start. But we're actually going to go small. We're going to do some of the Paul Reed stuff. There's different times where you'll have a a mix of different Heat players at the rim against Bam and some of those lobs. Like, I'm not even going to get on Harden's case for that. Like, what's Harden supposed to do where he's in between a show and a drop against Bam? (laughs) Like, it's just, it's just not going to happen. There's nothing, you're you're done. It's toast. Hero was terrific. Um, But Harden offensively, 20 minutes in the second half, one made field goal. Yes, they are trapping him. Um, His assist numbers were, I think he had four in the second half. I also think he has some incredibly lazy passes at times, but they're just overmatched. And I I don't don't know how there's any solution other than the Heat being bored. Uh, Hero was great, as you mentioned. And Oladipo, who the broadcast really seems to love Oladipo, and they say he's fought his way back in this playoff rotation. Well, the reason he's playing is that Lowry's out. Uh, And I like the Oladipo story. There's some, some... Hints at what he used to be, but over the course of a full game of the season, he's still not there. We know he's missed a ton of time, so I'm not saying, oh, he's washed, he's done, and all these things. I just feel like if you get something good out of him, great, but I don't know that you can be raising your expectations of getting something that's remotely close to not even Pacers Oladipo, maybe even Magic Oladipo. So I don't really know what the solution here is. All right, latest on Golden State Memphis, Gary Payton the second out three weeks. How crazy is it that we have his dad on and his dad goes, you know, talking about his son. He said, but if he dunked on me or my team like that, where these guys are doing this head scratch thing, where he threw it down on Bain, and then the Warriors bench started giving it to Bain on the inbound too in game one. GP was like, I'd break his back. 
I don't know if that's what this Dylan Brooks hit was on Gary Payton in game two. But it was vicious. It was really vicious. Another uh, observation, an aside, if you will allow it. We seem to be really bad with leg injuries, but we have no sympathy towards arm injuries. If somebody blows out a knee or something turns the wrong way in a leg, we're like, oh, why are you showing that? The Kevin Ware, Louisville, college basketball game. They're like, that's the all-timer. We're like, oh, how dare you? How dare you show this? You can't show this. And again, like, I don't, I'm not like an injury porn guy. I'm just telling you, like, sometimes I want to see how bad something is. I couldn't stand watching the way Gary Payton's arm landed. I I don't know how many, I've probably seen the clip 20 times. When it's an arm injury, there's no sympathy. There's no how could you. But when it's a leg injury, there is an observation. Do with it what you will. So as we head into game three, that really, Golden State's having a hard enough time with Ja. By the way, the world can't defend Ja. All right, so we could start there. Uh, you can get into some sort of discussion about what you need to do with Ja. Get into him. That used to be my favorite ones with some of these elite scores. Like, just get into his space. Just get into him a little bit. Um, rough him up. Ja gets the shit knocked out of him for 40 plus minutes and he gets up every single time. And yes, I'm worried about it too because I'm worried about the one time he's not going to get up. So he doesn't care. You can knock him around. You can hit him. He just has the first step. He has the handle. He has the body control that it's like at the top, top tier of basketball players that we've ever seen. He takes off, goes straight up. Everybody's figuring out what he's going to do. He's taking time. Hey, I'll throw it off of this angle. It's stupid. So I don't know that there's really anything you're going to do. And so now if Andre Iguodala, whose status has been upgraded for game three, does he solve that problem? I don't know. Uh, as I've talked about throughout playoffs for the entire time that I've ever talked about the playoffs, there's a lot of, well, that won't happen again. And we see a result. One team wins. One team loses. We find something that's odd and we go, well, that's not going to happen again. Okay, that thing likely won't happen again. That was odd. But that also means that something else will probably happen that we don't think will happen again that could replace that. So sometimes I think it works, but sometimes I think it won't. Because if we look at Golden State right now with Clay Thompson, he's 23% on 11 three-point attempts per game in this series. Wiggins, by the way, is 17% on six attempts. So if you look at Clay and say, well, that's not going to happen again. And I don't think Golden State's going to shoot it as poorly as they did in game two at Memphis as they'll be at home for game three and four. I don't think so. And But Memphis deserves credit for who they've been defensively in the playoffs because as we mentioned, Miami and Milwaukee being ahead of them defensively, Miami hasn't played anybody. You know, Miami's going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals, and I'm still going to be like, eh, I'm not sure how good they are. Milwaukee, if you get to play Chicago and that bakes into your defensive rating, I don't even know that that's a real, real indicator of who you've been in the playoffs. Memphis going up against Minnesota and Golden State for two games and being number three defensively in the playoffs, that to me is like being number one. So they're doing a really good job. So the other thing as I close here is that Clay just hasn't looked that good. His movement hasn't looked good. They go hunting for him. They're going to hunt for Steph. They're going to hunt for, for Poole. Uh, the Warriors have a real perimeter problem here with Ja. And they're just going to have to hope that he doesn't make threes like he has at times, which opens everything else up. Um, and it is that one-dimensional stuff that I don't necessarily love, but it was that was an all-time game, too. That's like playoff lore, legacy-making stuff, what Ja did in game two. <laughs> 